One of the most interesting, and by interesting I mean not interesting, channels to be critiqued on this channel are the Apollo detectives. Now they discuss the Apollo moon landings in great depth and are adamant that they didn't happen. Even going as far as to suggest that a pen, a pen, debunks the moon landings. <laughs> Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Tinfoil Tuesday with me, Simon and Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. Before we begin today, a huge thank you to the sponsors of today's video, Endel. Endel is an environment-based app which takes everything we know about sound and combines it with cutting-edge technology. The result is real-time, personalised soundscapes designed to help you relax, focus and sleep. You may be finding it hard to focus on your daily tasks or studying or working. Or you're suffering from stress and anxiety or you're struggling to be productive. Or you could be having trouble sleeping, you feel tired or your sleep quality is not good enough. Endor can help with all of these. Their patented core technology Endor Pacific adapts in real time to personal inputs like location, weather and heart rate. This means the app can personalise the sounds for maximum effect as it utilises the heart rate and circadian rhythm. Endor's soundscapes are based on neuroscientific and psychoacoustic principles and a recent survey has showed that many Endor users with ADHD, tinnitus and sleep disorders say that the app has helped them manage their symptoms. Now I can vouch for this, I've actually got the beginnings of tinnitus and I've been using the rainy outside option to help me sleep. It's inspired by the safe and comfortable feeling of being indoors while it's raining and it certainly helps me. If you need help falling asleep too, like me, then the first 100 people to download Endel by clicking the link below will get a free week of audio experiences. Right, back to today's video, which I'm actually really looking forward to today. The Apollo detectives are all set and ready to tell us how a pen debunks the moon landing. Take it away, gents. Here's another anomaly that'll keep the guys laughing. What we have is the Fisher space pen the famous pen that they used on all of the Apollo missions. And if you look at the details of this particular pen, it is rated at 45 PSI inside using a compressed nitrogen canister inside the pen. And that gives it the ability to write upside down so that if you're in zero gravity, you can write in all directions and it can be used underwater and all kinds of other stuff, right? Very good indeed, although I'm still confused as to why they didn't take a pencil, but hey-ho. The temperature range is from minus 30 to 250 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's all fine and dandy. However, because it has a small nitrogen canister in there, that canister is only capable of going to an elevation of 12,500 feet because of the low atmospheric pressure. If it goes higher than that, that little nitrogen canister is going to blow up. Even if it's in an environment that has pressure of a third of an atmosphere, as in the case of the Apollo command module. However, in the Apollo documents, we have an astronaut that actually wrote in the cue cards, and it clearly states that he wrote this at the base of the ladder before he got back in the LEM, just before a rest period, and he simply wrote in the cue card that on December 1972, the spirit of peace in which we came be reflected in the lives of all mankind. And that was written in a full vacuum. The pen, of course, is not going to work in that vacuum. And as soon as they depressurize the LEM or the CSM or, or whatever do a spacewalk, this pen is going to fail. That nitrogen canister is going to just simply blow up. At 45 PSI? That's only three atmospheres. Hell, a good truck tyre has a greater pressure difference inside it than that. Additionally, that pen was made from solid brass, a copper zinc alloy that can withstand over 3000 PSI of pressure. Finally, you mentioned that the pen would only work up to a distance of 12,500 feet. More on that later. But if that's your argument, then that's roughly 9 PSI at that height. That means the difference between the pen's cartridge and the atmosphere outside is 36 PSI, only half an atmosphere more than if the pen was in space. Already, you don't know what you're talking about. 
the nitrogen can is going to be like a can of Coke or Pepsi or whatever carbonated beverage of your choice. It's going to explode. And here's the video to prove that. Whoa. Congratulations. You managed to get a can of Sprite, which by the way is made from aluminium 0.2 millimeters thick, to explode in a vacuum. Not at all the same shape or material as the pen's cartridge. But it doesn't matter where you go and look at the details of this. The Fisher Space Pen, as much as people say that they spent millions of dollars to make this pen, the Fisher Space Pen was developed independently and sold to NASA, I think, for like $15 a piece or something like that back in the 60s. And what has that got to do with the price of fish? The fuel tanks that are on board of the LEM outside, those were made out of titanium. And that's the reason why they don't explode in the vacuum. Now you take this Fisher space pen, the cylinder is not made out of titanium, so it's going to be just like putting a can of pop inside of your vacuum chamber, turning it on and boom. Well, it's not, is it? As I said, the pen's ink cartridge is made from brass. Admittedly, not as strong as titanium, but strong enough to withstand the pressures that we're talking about here. That's right. That's why it was only rated to 12,500 feet. That is clearly stated in all of the documents that this pen doesn't work above that altitude. It's designed to overcome the gravitational force. So when you're writing upside down, it keeps the ink pushed against the ball so that it expresses itself and it was also waterproof enough to work underwater. That was the design of it. The ink must have been very specially made to work down that it wouldn't freeze down to minus 30. But of course, the lunar surface got a lot colder than that. So it would be interesting to see how NASA can explain that this thing worked and that apparently they had them available for all missions. Now the important thing here is to consider that the temperature can drop to be very low. Now the Apollo missions landed in areas of lunar dawn and that had temperatures between minus 23 degrees and 7 degrees. And of course anything Russian were doing they were using pencils because of this very problem. Which of course I knew before cracking that joke earlier. Now the pencils weren't used because they were worried that little pieces of lead would break off and then get into sensitive equipment. And it doesn't matter who wants to argue with it the documents are so clearly stated in this particular item on this pen that nobody can argue with it. The thing is, you don't need to argue with it because the documents don't contradict reality. One of the most interesting points about the Fisher Space Pen is that at 12,500 feet, you're down to about 10 PSI. 35,000 feet is about 5 PSI, and that's about the same pressure that the LEM and the CSM or the command module was running at in their trip. So the pen wouldn't even work at that pressure because it would have to be at least good for 35,000 feet to work even inside the craft. I'll tell you exactly why. Because you have exactly no clue about anything. That figure of 12,500 feet tells you how far that pen could write. As in, if you continued writing, it would write a distance of 12,500 feet. That's not how high that pen could write. Look at this paragraph. Several of the Fisher Space Pen models, the Millennium is one, are claimed to write for a lifetime of average use. However, the product literature states that the pen will write exactly 30.7 miles, 49.4 kilometers. In contrast, the standard PR, pressurized refill cartridge, is rated to write over 12,000 feet, 3,700 meters. What a massive fail that was, boys. Well, 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 how to fail at debunking the moon landing. Now this particular video from them has another Apollo anomaly uh, contained within it. And I think I'm gonna look at that one too at another time. But for today, we're all done and dusted for another Tim Ford Tuesday. Thank you so much for watching. It truly is appreciated. If you enjoyed it today, please do consider subscribing to the channel. We're close to 10,000 away from that half a million figure. Um, hopefully we get there soon and of course, if you really enjoyed it, hit that thumbs up button as well. Just enough time to once again thank Endor for sponsoring today's video. Remember the first 100 of you to download Endor by clicking the link in the description, get a free week 
of audio experiences. I've been Simon and Dan, have yourselves a great week and I'll see you all on Friday for the return of Taboo Conspiracy. See you then.